No talk would be complete without showing my daughter. This is Sasha making sure the doll stays safe. Um, if you think remote labs for college students are interesting, wait till you see remote kindergarten physical education. That'll uh, that'll scare your downstairs neighbors, I assure you. Okay, without much further ado, I will tell you a bit about some of the work my lab has done. Um, today we'll focus on batteries. We do some other things in my lab. This is work that is largely supported by the National Science Foundation. We were um, fortunate enough to get their RUI uh, ca uh, category of grants, the research at undergraduate institutions. Um, so that's been fantastic to have that support. Um, I'd like to open by observing that we've all got problems. Uh, one of mine was that in my commute, which used to be a lot longer, I would ruminate a lot in the car and music didn't seem to help. And I, I so desperately wanted to be a better Buddhist free from attachment to things that I started listening to audiobooks as I found that that helped a little bit. Um, and one of them, I, I'd like to listen to audiobooks that me being a chemist, I have no business listening to. Um, and this is one of them, a lot of business stuff. This is someone from the Harvard Business School um, who, <laughs> One of the, my favorite takeaways from this book uh, is that you will succeed, or at least you're more likely to succeed, if you offer people a solution to a problem they are already trying to solve. If what you offer them is a solution to a problem they don't actually have, you're in sales. And that's, that's a thing, right? And everybody needs sales. We're all in sales to some extent. But you'll do a lot better if you are addressing a problem they're actually trying to solve. And I think about this in the context of education. We don't have a chem major. So all of the students in my chemistry courses are either there by choice because it's an elective or there because it's a requirement for the major. There's a big difference in the problems those two groups are trying to solve. And so I, I try to think about how to teach to people who are trying to solve different problems. But here we're gonna talk about this in the context of batteries. Um, so the people tackling this are all undergraduates and actually occasionally a community college student or two. Um, we work on things like flexible batteries, batteries that could be for wearable technology that you could put in your watch and it will wrap around your wrist or come undone and the battery will retain all its properties. Uh, we, we delve into other things from time to time. We're working on a rehydrating coffee formulation. It doesn't taste very good. It works, but it doesn't taste good. Uh, today, I'll tell you about molecular electrochemistry, so real chemistry chemistry, where we're talking about molecules, discrete molecules rather than materials. Uh, and here we work with active fluids, and the goal is safer, faster charging batteries, and of course cost has to be in there as well. The lab uh, changes widely in size. There was one point when I did the count and realized I was terrified because I realized I was mentoring 14 students in independent projects at the same time. That's a bit above average. Um, typically, we're somewhere between four to six. Uh, the students in the pictures, this is Jada Carter, who goes by Carter at the left, and Haley Booth at an American Chemical Society national meeting. Um, Parker Smith is at the right, now at UC San Diego studying chemistry, and Levi Matsushima at the bottom, also studying chemistry at Santa Cruz. So two students in PhD programs in chemistry that didn't major in chemistry. Um, this is Levi, who just won the best poster award in the graduate session when he was an undergraduate in physical chemistry, a course he has not taken. Um, so we've done pretty well. Um, and I always encourage the students to apply to the graduate poster session, even though they're undergrads, because they never get turned down. So they get really great experience uh, defending their work against the groups there of surly chemists at the open bar poster session. All right. So what happens when you charge your phone? I see a little diagram on my phone screen. Um, and this is true for laptops or most consumer electronics. This is driven, this, this is a graphic, right? This is not the actual battery. And this is driven by software. Someone who wrote some code to make it estimate how much charge is in your battery and then give you a color code to give you an emotional response when it's read, oh man, I better charge my battery. So this is what happens on the screen. But what happens in the phone? You are likely to remember that batteries have two poles. They have a positive and a negative, and these are actually separate. These are two different uh, pieces of chemistry within any given battery. It could be a AA battery, it could be a nine volt, any of these things. Each has a positive set of chemistry and a negative set of chemistry. And when you charge, here we're taking an overly simplified case, going from zero all the way up to 100, you actually have to charge both sides. So you go from here at the left, that's representing zero with the bar, 
all the way to the right, we've charged both sides to 100%. But you'll notice that at the top of the screen, the word ideally appears. When are things really ideal? Never in chemistry, I can assure you that. So this doesn't happen, right? It would be perfect if we went from zero to 100 on both the positive and the negative side every time we use 100% of the capacity of the battery. So what actually happens, because John, you, you, you observed that we all had problems, that includes me, that's true. So what really happens is that typically one side just works a little better than the other side. They're never perfectly balanced. So in this case, we're gonna say that the, the negative side takes a little extra push to get to 100 because 1% 1 of this energy that I put in went to a side reaction, an unintended reaction, but only on one side. So one side charged faster than the other side. And here I'm talking by side, I mean the positive and the negative parts of the battery, the two halves. So now we've charged it up, but it's, it's like, it's not quite full, right? This is a 99%, not a hundred because then when I go to use this battery, what do I do? I discharge, but I discharge both sides and the discharge will stop as soon as either side hits zero. When I did that, one side went to zero, but the other one couldn't discharge all the way because as soon as one side hits the wall, they both have to stop. So that one stopped at one. Okay, what happens now? My battery is discharged. Plug it back in, charge it. Ah, oh, but I lost a percent again. And now if you do the math, you're going from 98 to two. Oh man, that's not 100, that's not even 99. That's 96% of the original capacity I had. But I'll keep using it because you know Google hasn't bought me a free Moto G whatever yet. So I'll, I'll hold on to this phone until, until they do again. Ah, oh, but I gotta do it again and I lost another percent, and then I lost more, and I lost more. And eventually you wind up with what I, th I assume many of us have in our homes, which is a laptop that's effectively a desktop because it won't hold a charge anymore. Um, and so the, the machine will run, but the battery won't store very much energy. And this is due to cumulative small inefficiencies. And as you, you might be guessing, this is exactly the type of problem that we all have that my lab is trying to solve. So takeaway is that even a small inefficiency, so it's, it's actually much less than 1%, but that's sort of an easy number to think about. Um, they, they add up, right? They're cumulative. They irreversibly damage either one half or both halves of a battery. This happens at um, high state of charge, that's SOC here. So when your battery is fully charged, these are worse. When your battery is at very low states of charge, if you let your phone run all the way down to zero, which I have only done once, these uh, damaging reactions are are more prevalent. Um, these are more prevalent at higher temperatures. So if you, let your, if you leave your phone out in the sun, in the, in the marina sunshine up here, um, it can damage it more quickly. Um, and it happens when you're charging or discharging fast. If you're using a lot of energy and discharging your battery, this, these uh, reactions are worse. Or if you're charging more quickly, these are worse. And the fast charge is one thing for a phone, right? I can, I can charge my phone overnight. But if I'm using an electric car, I want it charged now. So you'd like to be able to charge a car really quickly, but you don't want to damage the battery in the process. This is the type of thing that we're trying to solve. Um, one of the terms of art for this in the industry is capacity fade, because the battery still works. You just can't get as much energy out of it. You can't store as much energy in it. Okay, so I'm, as you'd imagine, not the first person to recognize this challenge. Um, there are many groups trying to prevent this or at least delay it. Um, Elon, well, not Elon, but the people Elon yells at uh, filed patent after patent on engineering solutions to this. And this is a diagram for coolant. So here, they are specifically trying to tackle the problem of temperature control. Keeping these capacity fade reactions from happening by keeping the temperature, well, slowing them down by keeping the temperature from getting too high. Uh, there are also chemical approaches to this instead of engineering approaches. Susan Odom, who's a professor at Kentucky, um, works on a pretty interesting class of molecules here. This one is my, one of my favorite abbreviations in chemistry, MEPT. Um, the idea here is that this molecule absorbs that extra energy that would have gone to an inefficiency and returns it back to the battery. And uh, these work, but the problem one of the challenges with these is stability. The second is that the molecule needs to be in exactly the right place. It's like, it's like the game of life. The molecule needs to be in the right place at the right time 
or it won't do its job. It won't take that extra energy. And that's what where we come in is to say, you know what? It's great if you add these to an existing battery, we're gonna make the battery out of those. Just put it everywhere in the battery so it is always in the right place when the time is right. Okay, we've still all got problems, but at least now we have an idea for a solution. So the problem people are trying to solve is faster, cheaper, safer batteries. How are we gonna do that? Well, we're all chemists here. So we're gonna do it by making active fluids that protect against these side reactions. So typically in a battery, there's a fluid that's just sort of a mediator, just allows all the reactants to talk to each other. What we're gonna do is make that fluid an active participant. Uh, the way we're gonna do that is with a class of materials that's hard to read the first time, but it gets easier every time, a word called a eutectic. It's not a word, the word is eutectic. A eutectic material is a mixture of two chemicals that actually then acts as a new chemical. It's almost like you made a new molecule. Typically, these are metals. The one here that looks like Terminator 2, if anyone's of the same era as I am, is the gallium indium eutectic. This one's fun because it's a fluid near room temperature, so you can kind of form it into interesting shapes, and it kind of holds them, kind of flows, pretty fun to play with. Um, sodium potassium is used as a cooling fluid in nuclear reactors. This is terrifying to me because it also explodes on contact with air or water. I don't use that one. Um, antifreeze, this is not actually the formulation that goes in the car. They do it, they find a cheaper one. But antifreeze, if you use the correct ratio of water and ethylene glycol, is a eutectic. So there are some pretty day-to-day -day examples of these as well. Um, what you need to know about these is that they're mixtures of two chemicals. And when they come together, the the mixture has a much lower melting point than you'd expect. So it's more likely to be a fluid. Okay. We do these with organic molecules, and a class of materials is called deep eutectic solvents, or DESs. These are ionic liquids, so ion, ionic means it's a salt. It's um, like these molecules here at the left of the screen, choline chloride. There are two parts to this, and they have charges, so that's a salt. Uh, and it's a liquid, uh, in inferring that, not the right verb, but you know what I mean, uh, suggesting, there it is, that the material is a, a fluid at room temp or liquid at room temp. So here we've got choline chloride. This is an additive in chicken feed, cheap, non-toxic, that's good. But it melts at 300 Celsius, it's hot. This is urea additive in many, many things, uh, fertilizer precursor, melts at 122 C, so somewhat higher than boiling water. So it's less hot, but still hot. When you mix these together in a two to one ratio, you get a, an entirely new species, which melts at 12 Celsius, but hey, John, Room temperature is about 18 to 20 Celsius. That's right. So the melting point or the freezing point here is below room temperature. Um, I like to say that because we don't have grad students, the molecules and their melting points are the ones that have to be severely depressed. I like Zoom because then when nobody laughs at my joke, I can say that it's just because they're muted. Um, it's made teaching a lot easier for me. Anyway, these uh, molecules have freezing points that are hundreds of degrees below where you'd expect them. So it's kind of neat. And these are references at the bottom for people who are originators in this field, really fun stuff if you're a chemist. So we'll work with these, um, but we'll add more interesting molecules. It's great to work with commodity chemicals that you can buy by the shipping container, right? By the metric ton, cheap, non-toxic, widely available, but they only do so much. Um, here's one, oh, okay, here's an example of this. These are kind of fun to do. I had to speed this video up because it does take a while. But if you combine two solids uh, and, and you wait and you stir them, you get, I'm gonna skip it, you get a liquid. So solid plus, I don't know why this one has sound, that's kind of weird, solid plus solid equals liquid. And you can see, or at least kind of see, it's pretty viscous. It's sort of like honey at room temperature. So it's not a free flowing liquid per se, but I added two solids that I bought and I got a liquid. They melted each other with no addition of heat, which is pretty cool. And this is how I end up engaging most of the students because that's just, it's just unusual, right? These are the corners of chemistry, uh, most chemistry to be frank, has been done, right? The stuff in the textbooks is hundreds of years old, but this is new, this is different. Um, so, this, so this is what we do. There are three opportunities for adding functionality. If you look at this from a point of view of chemistry, we have a couple of our papers down here at the bottom. We could play with the cation. This is the positive part. So it's got a plus sign, the positive charge. We could use this molecule to add some functionality. 
we could play with the HBD or hydrogen bond donor. These are molecules that have H's ready to donate, ready to share um, in these dashed line bonds at the right. Um, or we could play with the anion, the negative component or the hydrogen bond acceptor. Um, I'm not gonna belabor the molecular components of these, but largely at a, at a really, really high level like elevator pitch version of what we do, we buy chemicals where one of these three components is a lot more interesting than the ones that have been done before. And we don't do high throughput, but we do what I would consider medium throughput. We buy a lot of different chemicals at small scale and try them to see if they work. And not all of them work, but intuition guides, we get enough hits. Okay, uh, biologin is this molecule in the middle here, this thing with two plus charges. This at the bottom is paraquat. I don't know if there are any um, ag folks or uh, entomology. Well, I don't know, the, the enemy of the bug, folks. Um, this is used as a pesticide and it's a pretty potent one. Um, so it's, re it's reasonably toxic. So we work with this in small quantities and we use it carefully and we train students heavily before they work with it. But it does a lot of things. And we find that um, when we combine that with ethylene glycol, which is again, the molecule from antifreeze, we get a solid um, that turns into a, a liquid, not at room temperature, but quite close. Um, so 45 Celsius or 29 Celsius. Um, with these biologins, uh, we can get eutectics. We can get these um, materials that are salts that are fluid, in this case, near room temperature. Uh, so what you might ask here is what's called a cyclic voltammogram. So we've got current on the y-axis, that's how many electrons are flowing. We've got potential on the x-axis, that's how hard do I need to push to get the electrons to flow. Um, when you see this beautiful shape, which is, oh, I guess it's beautiful to me because I know what I'm looking for, um, these nice, um, what's called a wave in the forward direction going to the right, and then a wave in the backward direction going to the left, that means this molecule took an electron, that's plus one electron, but maybe more importantly from a battery perspective, it means the, the molecule gave it back. So this is, a, this is potentially a rechargeable battery, which seems... Um, you know, from a commercial perspective, seems like that's obvious. That's the only thing that's interesting. But when you try and make one, many of them don't do this. They'll take an electron, but they'll never give it back to you. So we we're pretty excited about this because here we have a salt fluid near room temperature that can be recharged. Pretty cool. Um, we show through this graph at the right, which again, this too, I will not belabor, but we show that this um, species, the biologin is freely diffusing. There's a relatively simple analysis you can do here. If this is a pretty close to a straight line, your molecule is freely diffusing, which really just tells us it's a solution. It's what we said it was. Pretty valuable. Okay, um, this may or may not mean that much to you, but it's 4.2 capital M in biology, and that's molar. There are 4.2 moles of this molecule for every liter of material. Again, if you're not calibrated to this, doesn't mean too much, but believe me when I say this is very, very, very highly concentrated. This is about two to three times as concentrated as you can make anything by just dissolving it in water. So pretty high concentration. That's good if we're trying to store energy. Um, one of my lab's bread and butter experiments that sets us apart for undergrad labs is done by combining two different experiments that normally just sit side by side on the bench. The UV-Vis near IR, near infrared um, spectrophotometer is an ex uh, a very, very expensive piece of gear that essentially measures the color of your sample uh, with a lot of digits. So it very, very um, accurately measures different colors in your solution. And you can see, you can kind of see here, it's purple in this grid down here, it just looks dark, but the rest of it is clear. The material goes in clear. Um, we add value to this experiment by doing electrochemistry at the same time. So effectively we charge half the battery, that's what's here down here in purple, and measure the change in color. So we measured it when it was clear, not very colored, measured it when it was purple, very colored. And we get these graphs at the right. Um, you can either do this in a dilute state, which is the dashed red line, or in the concentrated sort of battery-like state. That's the black line, solid line. And you can see that they, they share some features, but they're a little bit different. Um, we see broadening. We see differences in relative intensity. Um, we said the, the high-level conclusion here was that, okay, we turned this off-the-shelf molecule into a new type of fluid, and it retains its behavior. It can take an electron and give it back. And it retains some of the color features, the spectroscopic features that tell us about what the molecule is really doing. Uh, I did a much more in-depth analysis here 
um, that I'll walk through pretty quickly. And if you're a chemist or are curious, we can talk about it after the talk for sure. I compared dilute solutions plus some published solutions of this molecule plus our new super concentrated battery solution um, and find basically extract physical parameters. Um, we find that all the other materials are what's called isosbestic, another fun word to say, which means there are points um, where the lines kind of rotate around the point. So I got, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I have it over one now at the left, right around 550 nanometers, there's a point where all the different lines intersect. And at 750 something nanometers, there's another one of these points, but you can see the black line doesn't cross there. This tells us that something different is happening for lack of a more nuanced explanation. Um, this suggests that there are multiple equilibria in solution, which I modeled with some modeling software. Um, and you can read the ChemCom paper there if you're curious about that. Or of course, we can talk about it afterwards. But there are many, many behaviors happening in solution, and we figured them out, and that's how you publish a paper. Um, so chem, chemical communications or ChemCom is a really, really great, is a really good journal. And publishing in this, which we did before the NSF grant, is what I, I, I think got us the grant, showing that, yeah, we're for real. Yes, we're undergrads. No, we're not chem majors, but we can really do stuff. We can compete with grad student, grad schools um, in terms of the papers we can publish. Okay, so that was uh, half of a battery. Uh, I set one of my students, well, a couple of my students, but Carter's the one who got it to work, um, working on bifunctional batteries where the fluid can accept an electron, that's the biologin, that's what you saw before, but it can also give an electron and then take it back afterwards. And that's this uh, graph on the right here, as you'll see two of these sets of waves. And that means this is a full battery. It's not a very good one, but it is a full battery. You can store energy and you can get it back. Um, in addition to acting as the battery itself, this can also act to protect an existing battery. And that's the, where, we're, where we're going with this, because I think that'll have a bigger impact. Um, that's when we get away from the tractor trailer size batteries that are good for wind turbines, but not good for much else. And we start talking to the Panasonics of the world, the, the companies that make batteries for electric cars and other commercial devices. Um, so Carter published this in the Journal of Molecular Liquids earlier this year. And my Zoom window is in the way, so I don't even know what else is on here. Okay, yep. So that is most of the chemistry. That's all the molecular stuff I'm going to tell you about today. Um, here is probably what I should start this talk with, because here's the why. And you always start with why, unless you're a scientist, which is why you're a scientist. And I can talk in circles. Here's a char chart for charging a Tesla. Starts from pretty close to zero. So that's the, the y-axis here is given in... So the blue curve corresponds to the right y-axis. There's a lot going on here. This is how many miles, not, this is how many miles you could drive on that charge. So it starts out pretty low, whoops. Starts out pretty low and goes up, but you'll see the slope of this blue curve kind of flattens off, right? As it starts to get closer and closer to fully charged, the charging slows down. And this is done on purpose with software and usually hardware backup to ensure that the battery lasts as long as possible. Because if your Tesla charges real fast, but you got to get the battery replaced after only a year of using it, you're not going to get a Tesla when that one wears out. You're going to get a leaf or whatever, right? So this takes 20 minutes to get up half charged, but it takes 55 additional minutes to do the second half of the charging. That's what we're trying to get at here. Um, if we use our materials, then we can cut off basically the whole right side of this graph and charge at the fast rate the entire time. And then it only takes you half an hour to get the full charge if our science becomes technology. This saves you 45 minutes every single time you charge the car. The gift that gives back. So this is a balancing act, right? You have to, if you're making a performance improvement, you're probably going to, it's going to cost more. Right? If we're going to add a more functional fluid, that's more expensive than the fluid that they use now. So the, the game here transitions once the science works to, to both technology development, which is building the batteries and testing them, um, and techno-economic modeling, which is, okay, John, you improved the performance, but did you improve it enough to be worth the extra expense? And that's sort of where we're, that's another place that we're headed. Okay, we have another project that I won't tell you too much about today, um, but it focuses more on safety rather than durability or capacity. 
And this is focused on safe hardware-based shutdown mechanisms. So there's plenty of software-based shutdown mechanisms. Have you ever had your phone restart spontaneously because the software freaks out? There's things like that. Um, so here, if you do a search for battery fire airplane, this is actually a little bit aged at this point, but um, you can see there are 58,000 results. Um, my favorite result here is the third one because it lets me tell my daughter that smoking can kill you more than one way. Okay, not funny, but um, you got you to try. Um, so the, these, there's still work to be done. Big improvements have been made over the last 15 years or so um, in preventing fires, but they still happen. So there's still work that's needed. And one of our other projects does that. It's a, it's a shutdown mechanism. So if you, if you engage this mechanism, the battery is toasted. You'll never charge it again, but at least it's not catching on fire. That's the second, second uh, push from this type of stuff in our lab. Okay. Uh, Sometimes you have a pandemic and you go online and you don't get into your lab for a while. Um, so we wrote a bunch of papers, but we started working with uh, chem informatics as well, looking at the chemical side or the computer computational side of what we're working on. We found a eutectic database um, published as part of a government, a, a Department of Energy funded thing from 1978. And it's now in a PDF, a not so great PDF, but I found it online. This is great. It's got hundreds of pages of tables, but I can't look things up in it because it's the, the, the PDF is, is a scan of a really old document that didn't come through that well, so I can't even search on the PDF. So I set a bunch of students um, working with Acrobat, um, Python, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a, a pretty popular programming language, and then what I call digital labor, um, correcting some of these formulas. So here's just an example. We took this old PDF, and uh, many moons later converted it into a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, this can be turned into a database proper. So that's where I believe this is headed. Um, but this is a beautiful combination of some code automating some really boring stuff so students didn't have to type in thousands of things, but combined with personal um, chemical intuition because some of the chemicals came in with typos effectively. So the students and I all got in there and one by one checked them all. Um, which is a pretty nice combination of things. We're hoping to publish that pretty soon. Um, you don't have to say that. That's the title. I mean, you could, but that's OK. Um, so there are many, many papers. Hundreds of papers come out every day in chemistry. And anyone trying to turn these into a more searchable format, like a database, uh, has, has a challenge ahead of them because curating is the word that's the, the term of art that's used here it means extracting all the information of a particular type in this case the chemical itself um, in a paper into a machine readable format so that a, a database can recognize okay I know what chemical you're looking for and I know where to find it um, this can be done already Google does this IBM does this there are probably others but no one did it openly that is no one uh, provided the code so that anyone who wants to could do it themselves. So we did that. Um, another professor here, Catherine Nelson, and a, a very, very talented student named Charles Scribner did this with me. Um, we've written most of a manuscript that has a classic professor thing. It's been on my desk, so to speak, for several weeks. I haven't done anything about it. I should do that. Um, you upload a PDF, click go, and it gives you a table of all the molecules mentioned in there with structures. Um, so potentially pretty powerful tool. Um, I think there are some law firms that might be interested in this. I think there are some consulting firms that might be interested in this, but to be frank, we made it open so that anyone can do it. Um, this seems like a good opportunity for the democratization of chemistry. Um, but then there's also snacks, because you write in code, you can't snack in lab, but now that we're writing code and we're thinking about molecules from home, we could snack. And that's a good thing. And since we don't have a chem major, but we do have some really, uh, really strong computer science department uh, faculty and some really strong um, biology related computation um, at CSUMB, would it be neat to, to tune them in a little bit to the chemical side? It might be. Um, that's one of the best. If you haven't had them, I recommend them highly. If, the, if you take one thing away from today's talk, try the cheddar jalapeno Cheetos. You can get a subscribe and save box of them on Amazon like we do. So you can get these little snack packs delivered every month. It's very, very good. Not Maybe not what you thought you were coming in for today, but you, but you learned something. This is a piece of Google that not too many people know about called Colab for collaboration, basically. Um, it is a hosted 
uh, environment for running Python. So installing this on your computer is not the not the end of the world, but it's not exactly plug and play either. But here, everything runs on Google's computers. Um, presumably, they are uh, using AI to scrape my code and see if there's anything they want in it. But in return, I get to use their computers for free. So I'll take it. The instructions for each section are written in green. If you don't want to read them, but you do want to do this, you don't, re you don't really have to read them. It's sort of like an undergrad class. You don't actually have to read the work. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if you click the play button in the corner of each box, it will do whatever, whatever's in this window. So in this case, it's importing and installing some things. Um, and you don't need to think too hard about that. But here, in the next box, there's a text field. Please either put in the chat or unmute yourselves, what household product should we do here? Somebody give me a suggestion. Could be a snack, could be like a shampoo. What should we do? Cascade for dishwashers. Okay. Cascade dishwasher detergent. So I type that one in. And then I will open up a new tab, cascade detergent ingredients. Okay, you will find many options for this. Often you can just kind of copy it from the Google result preview here. If not, you can go to a web page and get it. Copy the ingredients, paste them in here, click play. And the code will try to separate each of those um, by commas and see what they are. And then you go down and down and down and click play in each box. It will do some text processing. And eventually it will query servers at the National Institutes of Health that were set up to recognize chemicals. Um, so here, not a very exciting list, but you can see it recognized these chemicals. And if you just keep going, process, process, process. This, if you then click the files, um, it gives you a result file. And this one, upload, submit. That just went to my Google Drive. Um, this is something that we're trying to have, sort of like the chemistry cookbook that I was mentioning earlier. We're trying to get students thinking about the intersection between coding and chemistry, but using a framing that they all have experience with. So when we try to come up with examples in lower division teaching, we can say electrochemistry is used in fuel cells and one or two people in a room of 200 will say, yeah, fuel cells. And the rest of the room is like, I, it doesn't mean anything to me, right? So it's hard to get something that really works with everyone's experience, food. Everyone can talk about food. So that's one that we've used quite a bit. Um, so this goes into where everybody uploaded it if they used the form and aggregates all of those and puts all the ingredients together. Um, this we can then interface with toxicity databases, um, safety profiles, hazards, things like that. Um, so this has been pretty fun, a way to get some students who ordinarily might not have been super engaged in the lab um, to, to try some things and think about um, computational work as well. This groups all of these together. There are two things, the ingredient as listed, um, and then what's called a smiles string. Some of these you can see are chemicals. Some of them just sort of look like nonsense. This is a computer, a machine readable format for a molecule. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping for this code um, to what a chemical is represented. Um, I have tons and tons of undergrad researchers to thank. Um, when I was interviewing for this job, people said, hopefully your research will involve undergrads. It has to. One, that's the reason we're at CSUMB. Two, I'm not doing all this stuff myself. I need help. Um, so I have to thank all the undergrads who helped me with that. Um, thankfully, many of them are on doing wonderful things now. Um, one of them was an extremely talented graphic designer. Um, so she made me a lab logo. I have, I think I actually have a Flamingo shirt on. Um, so this is uh, an electron embedded in my name um, and then a lab logo. I have to thank the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Center, UROC, for helping me get the lab off the ground. Um, and of course, the National Science Foundation for their funding and many, many mentors and advocates along the way. So with that, we're a little early, but um, I think there's hopefully is some room for interaction. So happy to take questions, happy to, to see what we can do. Wonderful. We have two questions on the chat to get us started. And one is if you can comment on QuantumScape's battery technology. I wish I could. Um, I, like so many others before me, have done my best to dig through the patents and try and figure out exactly what they're doing. And they're, they're doing a real good job of telling, publicly releasing really good things 
and not publicly releasing really good things. Um, so I so I actually can't. Um, I, I think it's really promising um, based on the descriptions. Um, Thomas Edison is credited with saying there are three types of people in this world. There are liars, there are damn liars, and there are battery people. Um, so with anyone comes in and says, it's 100% efficient. It's the best battery in the, but like we all do that, right? We all hype up the thing that we invented, that we made. Um, so it's, uh, it's hard to give a completely, what's the word I'm looking for? Completely like removed and neutral assessment of their technology, but I think it's great. Um, I hope it works. It's really neat stuff. Just great outside the box ideas for storing energy. Wonderful. We have one more in the chat that I thought we'd get to Bob first. Would you like to go ahead? Oh, yes. Hi. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, but I'm confused about something. I'm hearing from a lot of people about the dendrites that grow on the uh, lithium dendrites. And after a while, they'll short out your battery. And you're supposed to 100% charge to keep them from growing. But then on uh, the other hand, I hear people say, don't charge your batteries to 100% because uh, they won't live that long. And so, so I'm confused. So what 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 do you what can you help uh, explain about that? Yeah, as as is so often the case, you're both right. Um, yeah, so the um, I I never charge my phone to 100 if I can help it. Sometimes I forget. Um, but all the things that I charge, uh, with the exception, I guess, of my 2015 Prius, which I have very little control over, um, I try to keep my phone between 10 and 90 percent to try to make it last longer. These do not have such bad problems with dendrites. You will occasionally have a battery that just, just fails um, due to, so a dendrite is a, almost like a stalactite is what they look like. Um, and it grows from one of the two electrodes and it comes out in this little pointy needle and it grows and then it goes away and then it grows and then it goes away. But over time, um, if, if you don't mitigate it, it will eventually keep growing and puncture through the separator and then short out the battery, um, just like you said. Um, there are additives that can help with that. Um, there are charging cycles that can help with that. I, as far as I know, the modern lithium ion batteries don't have as big of a challenge with that. Um, so it used to be with nickel metal hydride in particular, there was the memory effect and you had to fully charge it the first time. They got over that. The lithium ion dendrites, it still happens. It's more of a problem, my understanding is that it's more of a problem in zinc batteries, um, which are, well, I guess zinc air is a really neat type of battery. It's the one in hearing aids. Um, it's where you just pull the tab off and this beautifully in cheap and efficient battery works. Um, they're awesome, but they're not yet rechargeable. Um, it's the rechargeable ones where you worry about dendrites. So now I'm getting, I'm, as you can tell, you've hit a good question because I'm rambling excitedly. Um, I wouldn't worry about the dendrites in my personal electronics of any kind. Um, I worry about the capacity because the dendrite is a thing that will happen with some probability that I have very little control over. So I just go for it and try to keep the, try to keep all my batteries between 10 and 90. Thank you. We had a question from Jay. If you could explain the chemistry that leads to battery fires. Typically, or I should say traditional battery fires, which is a fun phrase to turn, um, happen when the battery gets so hot that what's called the separator, which literally that is its job, the thing that keeps the positive and the negative parts from touching, if it gets so hot that that melts, that's how a lot of fires happen. And if you've heard of thermal runaway, that's when that happens there as well. If the battery gets hot enough that the two sides mix, that's exothermic, which if you remember your 100 level chemistry means energy is released. Heat energy is released. So I heated the thing up until it mixed, then it gets hotter. Then it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and eventually something has to lose and catches on fire. Um, that has largely been solved by making separators that fail in a safe way. So when they melt, they sort of melt into a new type of solid and still keep the two parts apart. That's mostly been fixed. You can still get a fire if you have a dendrite. Um, if the two sides short out, you can create a lot of heat. Um, usually it's not so much a chemical thing as a, I guess a physical phenomenon. 
So it's driven when two chemicals react and release heat, but then it's when that runs away from you that you end up with the problem and you end up with the fire. I'm so confused about why it got too hot in the first place. Oh, great question. So thank you. Anyone remember Ohm's law, V equals IR? So that's from like physics back in the day. If you're me back in the day, maybe you still do it, but um, nothing is 100% efficient. And anytime you're passing current, you have a resistive loss. Almost all of that shows up as heat. So anytime you're charging the battery, it gets hot. Anytime you're discharging the battery, which means you're using it, it gets hot. So anything you do with it releases some heat. Um, you ever run something real taxing on your computer and the fan turns on because it's working, passing a lot of current, and now it's got to move that heat somewhere else. Most, most batteries don't come with fans. So anytime you're passing current, particularly if you're charging quickly, you might notice uh, your phone or something else gets hot. Um, that's where the heat comes from. And then, so there's that, and then the external forces. If you leave it in the sun, if it's just hot where you are, um, those are the times. You'll notice that they used to ship batteries. If you order a phone through the mail or anything with a battery in it, it used to ship basically fully discharged. Now they've kind of inched it up so it can be shipped at, I forget what the regulation is, 35 or something like that, percent state of charge. So it can get somewhat hotter if it sits in the UPS truck um, in the heat longer but there's still a risk of both the internal heat when you're using it and the external heat um, just driven by the environment i had a question on um so-called transition metals or trace metals ones that are mm. hard to find and maybe expensive is that a limitation for batteries or are you are your you technic substances you're working on get around that that's a, yeah it's a really good question this is something that is actually pretty near and dear to my heart. So there's there's two parts of this that I'll try and parse. Um, one is trace metals. That's when, at least in the battery context, that's an impurity. Um, and this was a really big problem for lead acid batteries a couple of decades ago, where small amounts of antimony, which is SB if you're a periodic table phonetic, um, was, were just present in lead, right? Nothing's 100% pure. So little bits were in there and those were causing lots of problems. They, they acted as catalysts and generated hydrogen gas. And if you ever have seen a valve, valve regulated lead acid battery, which this, as people might hear, I talk about this with students, they don't know what I'm talking about anymore, but that has a valve that burps out the hydrogen. Flammable gas burps out of your car battery, or my car battery, um, which is kind of scary, but they've engineered it to be pretty safe. Um, trace metals contribute to that. So the whole game was, what's the, what's the cost optimization for the cheapest lead I can buy Cheaper lead has more impurities, that's not good. And the cheapest additive I can add, they found out vanilla of all things, um, binds to antimony and reduces this, uh, this side reaction. So trace metals are a problem in that way. Transition metals is most of the periodic table, everything in the middle. That includes nickel, iron, cobalt, that sort of thing. Cobalt is one that I call out because it, it is a component of the best lithium ion batteries that we can, that are, I should say, that are in mass production. Um, it's mined in the Philippines and the DRC, the Congo. And the Philippines is perhaps not the best nation in the world for labor rights, but it's better than the Congo. Um, and you can read news reports of this. There are, uh, it's, there are big issues with slave labor and child labor in the mining of cobalt. And global supply chain is, is huge right now, right? Because everything's super interconnected. We're producing things all over the place. Tesla is a California company with batteries that are made in the Philippines and you know everything's everywhere, right? Um, batteries that are made in the Philippines with materials sourced from New Caledonia and the Congo, right, the list goes on. So tracking and tracing where your cobalt came from is not trivial. And there have been very, very big advances in that um, in sort of, I wanna save the world. So I'm gonna buy an electric car, but it took child labor to get the battery to do it, right? Um, there's been improvements in transparency and execution for this. So things have gotten better, but cobalt is the one that I'll flag. There are others. Tantalum is a problem. Um, others, I can't think of any right now, but cobalt's the biggest one right now. So some of my students in environmental chemistry this semester are actually gonna tackle that to say, okay, where, what is the state of the art? What's the, what's, you know, if I wrote a review paper now, how are we doing? for human rights and labor rights issues with respect to cobalt mining. Elon Musk said at the Battery Day, their big like hype event, boy, when was that? Maybe six months ago or something like that? Maybe a year ago, said, we gotta get away from cobalt. I want more nickel. And this is like Elon's leadership style, right? He tweets a thing and then his company goes, oh, 
better better do that. Um, so a lot of companies are moving in that direction anyway. Nickel is okay, and we're trying to make it as we the community is trying to make it as good as the cobalt based batteries. Um, it's, yeah, it's a huge question for you know we're trying to make improvements. Do we did we muck something else up and trying to do that? So we have three more in the chat right now, and one of them's from Warren about your thoughts about flywheel energy storage systems. Yeah, so there's um, you can find a chart. So a flywheel is 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 a wheel, um, and it is a way of mechanically storing energy. So you basically get a wheel spinning, and then almost like regenerative braking in the Prius that I have or the Tesla that you may have. Um, when the car slows down, it takes some of that mechanical energy and uses it to charge a battery um, through processes that frankly I haven't thought about in a very long time, but it's a, it's a form of mechanical storage of energy. Whereas what I talked about today and most all, all batteries are electrochemical storage. So it's taking current in and out electron flow but storing it in molecules that are in different states. Whereas a flywheel is just the, the how fast it's spinning, how much momentum or energy is stored in that way. Flywheels are really good for short duration, high energy discharge. So how long does my phone battery last? I mean, it depends on how many Scrabble games you're playing with it, right? But um, hours, hours to maybe days, right? Flywheels are good for like a second. And I don't mean that in the colloquial sense of like a second. I mean, actually about one second um, or milliseconds even. They're really, really good at short duration problem solving. So if you have an electric grid that you want to be stable because your, your customers are running their Xboxes and they need that power, right? Otherwise they're among us game, they lose and their friends get all mad at them or their TikTok goes out or whatever the kids are using these days. If you need to stabilize a large amount of energy for a short duration, like the generator had a problem, but it's back. Flywheels are fantastic for that. Um, the form of mechanical energy storage that's really, really good for long duration is uh, what's called pumped hydro. So just uh, water that's pumped uphill and then put back down. Think about like a Niagara Falls type of thing, except regenerable. This is great, but it's hard to do unless you happen to install your plant where there is a dam and a lake and you know a couple of other requirements. So it's great, but it's pretty location specific. Whereas a flywheel can be done anywhere there's space, but it's really only good for short duration. You can find a chart of power versus energy. So power is the instantaneous, like how hard can I push? And energy is the, how much work can I do? And they're related, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, you can find a chart of different types of energy storage for those and it'll tell you what the power and energy or duration, like duration are for different things. So flywheel, very high power, very short time. And Charlene wanted to know if you can share, and we talked about this a little earlier, the pros and cons of generators and Tesla battery walls as emergency power backup. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually did, I actually did a project for with the Naval Postgraduate School looking at um, backup for one of their overseas bases. And I looked at diesel generators, which is sort of the de facto solution, um, and lithium ion batteries and lead acid batteries and all these different things. And by more than an order of magnitude, diesel generator is the cheapest even accounting for the fact that if you have a tank of diesel and you don't use it for, for emergencies, you have to replace the diesel because diesel goes stale effectively on the like six months to a year time frame. Even if you do that, diesel is so much cheaper than any other type of energy storage that that's what you do if the dollar is the only thing you care about. Um, for home use, I guess there it depends. The, the power wall um, and any sort of, uh, so that's Tesla's product. That's a thin lithium ion battery pack that looks real slick and goes, ideally goes on your garage wall. Um, those make economic sense if you use them, which is kind of a silly sentence to say, but it's, you know, it's an upfront investment that if you're cycling that every day or once a week or something like that, like you have solar panels on your roof and at night you want to keep using that energy so during the day, you use some of that solar power to charge up the battery pack. Hey, then I'm still using solar power at night through the battery. If you do that, then you are adding, effectively you're adding value to your, to your use case, right? Um, you added cost when you bought the thing, but now because you're using it, you're adding value. If you buy it and don't use it, it's just the cost. And you could argue that, oh, it's peace of mind or insurance or something like that, and that's, that's completely valid. Um, 
But I think it depends on two things, the way you actually make the decision for what you want to do is how often am I going to use it? And what's the discharge time that I need? If you need to have your house um, off grid, but powered for days, you probably want the, the fossil fuel. If it's ours, battery packs probably fine. And we're wondering if you can talk about the cost, say per miles of gas versus electric charging, the current situation. Depending on your electricity rate and where you are, and if you get something, you know, a special deal, some of the area parts of PG&E or some of the other providers will give you a, a deal if you're using it for renewable energy transportation or whatever that kind of thing. Um, it, it varies, um, to be frank. Uh, Electricity produced by nuclear and natural gas, which is the natural gas is the dominant one in California, tends to be really, really cheap. Um, and that is good, good because you can get energy cheaply and charge your electric vehicle with natural gas powered electricity, makes you think. Um, that's, pretty, that's pretty compelling from a cost perspective versus buying gas, um, even at the Costco gas station, which I highly, um, cheddar jalapeno Cheetos and the Costco gas station are my two recommendations for today. Both, both changed my life. Um, I had, cause I like making spreadsheets. So I had this big spreadsheet when I was, I had a diesel Volkswagen that was involved in the diesel emission scandal. And I was like, I teach environmental chemistry and I got a diesel Volkswagen that's emitting socks and knocks and all these bad things. So I turned that back in and I had this huge spreadsheet for what car I was gonna get instead. And I ended up getting a Subaru because it was the best match, which I've since traded in for a Prius, but um, that ended up being sort of the best match. You know, you look at the Tesla, the Model 3 wasn't out yet, and even that's kind of out of range. But um, for a personal decision, there's so many things that go into it. For straight up cost, if you can front the cost to get a Tesla and use the superchargers, it's great, but you're paying all the money up front. So then you get into like cost of capital and all these sort of other if you really want to get quantitative, then you start getting sort of more business and finance minded about it. But just from a like, what's my bill perspective, I, you can get a Prius or you could get if you if you're the range works for you, you can get a Nissan Leaf and those are probably the two cheapest things you can do. Can you send us out with some helpful information about the disposal of batteries? Yes. Um, I have two things. One is is very like John, what do I actually do? And the other is, where is this, where is this technology headed? Um, so what you actually do is, is, is not trivial, which is frustrating, right? Um, it's hard enough in this day and age to know what I'm supposed to do with recycling and what goes in the trash. What do I have to take to the landfill and marina for them to do the chemical disposal? When in doubt, um, take it up to the marina landfill because they're super friendly. You'd drive through, everybody's masked. You just hand them your old cell phone that you wiped and they, they deal with it for you. Um, most AA batteries and sort of that little thing can, can go in the trash. Um, that said, I put them in a bag because it's, it's frankly, it's a lot of information to parse. And this is what I do all day, right? Um, I know how to interpret the things I find on the internet and it's still a lot to try to figure out. So I, I keep them in Ziploc bags and when they're full, I take them up to Marina and just hand them out the car window. I talked about cobalt and cobalt mining has all sorts of issues associated with it from a human perspective. One of my students now, Haley Booth, who published one of the papers uh, that I talked about today has decided she wants to tackle that. So she's gonna look at these eutectic materials um, as a way of extracting the cobalt from a dead lithium ion battery. So something that's at the end of life, it's been used, recovering and purifying the four or five different types of metals in there is not trivial. Dissolving everything you can do, but that's not that helpful. But pulling one out at a time, we actually think we have a way to target the cobalt. So she's gonna try that. What other companies should we have an eye out for that are doing great work aside from Tesla and QuantumScape? Should we be looking this at? This is a good one. Um, the defense companies, uh, the sort of who you think of as like the normal defense companies, the Raytheon, the Lockheed Martin, um, that group actually does a lot in this. And there are pundits that will say the only reason they got into that is because it's the only business left that's big enough to move the needle on a Fortune 100 company. I, I'm, I'm staying out of that argument. Um, they can sell a lot of batteries to the military um, and related groups. And it, Lockheed has zero problem making a profit by selling it to renewable energy companies as well. Um, so they, they've decided they can really actually get some stuff done. So the defense companies went on buying sprees, snapping up energy startups. 
Um, the other place that I would look if you want to have some fun reading about it is ARPA-E. So you may have heard of DARPA, that's the Defense Advanced Research Projects. And when Al Gore tells you he invented the internet or at that time, the ARPANET, um, one of the modern incarnations of that is energy focused and it's the Advanced Research Projects Agency, Energy, which is really dramatic. Um, it's a very informal group, they're a lot of fun. And their website is a gold mine of what's next. And this is the group that was accused by uh, some politicians of pick, not just picking winners, but picking losers. That said, they've picked some winners too, right? This is how investing goes. Not everything is gonna win, but many of them do. Um, so if you go to ARPA-E's website, they have the things they're currently funding, some of which are academic, but most are industry. Um, and they'll have their previous uh, companies and groups that they've worked with as well. So that's, a, that's one that's kind of fun and it's, it's a good way to find new stuff. Thank you again, Dr. Geltz, for spending this morning with us. And thanks all of you for your great questions. Thanks, be in everybody. touch with an email with some more information and we look forward to seeing you again. Keep well. Thanks everyone.